Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Marissa Duvall? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Marissa Duvall was born in 1977 and grew up in Lake Havasu, Arizona. This is just over three hours west of Phoenix. Marissa grew up in poverty and would later claim that she was mistreated by her mother and stepfather. Her mother had a number of romantic relationships when Marissa was young, which may have made an impression on her. When Marissa was in high school, she was described as always wanting to be the center of attention. Marissa dated many men, she had an extremely large number of romantic partners and was described as promiscuous. She became pregnant at 17 and had a daughter. Marissa was not sure who the father was. After this, Marissa made a living working in a series of low-level jobs. She either had difficulty keeping jobs or she liked to change them frequently. She was able to keep one job for a while. Marissa worked as a dancer. She was the type of dancer who adhered to a philosophy of clothing minimalism. Marissa was unhappy with her life and decided to go to community college, but she kept changing what she wanted to study. For example, at various times, she wanted to be an accountant and a lawyer. In 1997, Marissa ran into a man who she had briefly dated in high school named Dale Duvall. He was an air conditioning technician. Despite having a talent for cooling things down, his relationship with Marissa became hotter right away. About six months into the relationship, Dale had to move to Tempe, Arizona for his job. Marissa and her daughter moved with Dale and lived together as a family. As Dale continued to work, Marissa struggled in her career. She worked as a makeup consultant, was employed by a phone company, and had many other jobs. On September 6, 1999, Marissa and Dale married. By 2002, they had two daughters. Seven years later, the couple moved to a house in Gilbert, Arizona. This is a suburb of Phoenix. After living there for a while, Marissa made a deal with a man named Stanley Cook Jr. She allowed Stanley to live in the family house if he would perform chores, like watching the children. Stanley had been involved in a motorcycle collision in 1998 and sustained a traumatic brain injury. He had short-term memory problems as a result. It appears as though Stanley was disoriented, and highly suggestible. As Dale continued to work in a stable job, Marissa told people that she worked in a real estate business owned by a man named Alan Flores. In reality, Marissa and Alan met on a Sugar Daddy website in 2007. This website was designed to help older successful men find younger financially challenged women. Alan ended up giving Marissa about $362,000 over the course of two years but it was not hers to keep. Alan considered it to be a loan with an interest rate of 2.5%. He even had Marissa sign a promissory note in 2007 and another one in 2009. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On January 14, 2009, at 2.45 a.m., 31-year-old Marissa Duvall called 911. She disconnected the call and the operator called her back. Marissa told the operator that her husband, Dale, tried to hurt her and once again disconnected the call. Marissa called 911 for a second time and said that Dale tried to strangle her. She was sobbing hysterically on the call, which made it difficult to understand what she was trying to communicate. When the police arrived at the Duval residence, they found Marissa still behaving in an erratic manner. At one point, she threw her phone on the driveway. Stanley Cook Jr., who lived with the Duvall family, exited the house and was confronted by the police. They searched him and found a pistol. Marissa and Stanley were placed in separate police vehicles. When the police entered the house, they found Dale dead on the bedroom floor with a bloody hammer nearby. Dale had sustained a massive head injury. There was a hole in his head the size of a softball. Blood spatter was all over the bedroom and a large quantity of blood was on his pillow. Dale was alive, but in pretty bad shape. He was transported to a nearby hospital. 
Marissa told the police that she and Dale were fighting about divorce when he flew into a rage. Dale retrieved a hammer as if to attack her, but then he put the hammer down and choked her instead. Stanley heard the altercation, entered the bedroom, saw the hammer, picked it up, and then used it to strike Dale in the head. When Stanley was questioned, he appeared to corroborate Marissa's story. When the police asked Stanley for more details about what happened, he said he couldn't remember. After this, he said he probably needed a lawyer, so the police ended the interview. Marissa was taken to a hospital, but did not have any significant injuries. When the police spoke to her again, Marissa changed her story. Here's what she told the police this time. She was in bed when Dale climbed on top of her. He placed his hands around her neck. Marissa blacked out, and the next thing she remembered was seeing Stanley with a hammer in his hand, standing over Dale. Marissa claimed that she had used the hammer earlier to hang a painting, which is why it was in the bedroom. Stanley struck Dale several times with the hammer. Dale fell onto Marissa. She pushed Dale off her and called 911. Marissa believed that Stanley saved her life. He was a hammer-enhanced hero who protected her from the dreadful and depraved devil. Marissa claimed that Dale had attacked her several times throughout their marriage. She explained to the police how she was in the process of getting a divorce. Marissa's story about the killing did not make sense. She claimed that Dale was on top of her, but Dale's blood was all over his pillow. It looked like he was attacked in his sleep as his head was resting on this pillow. The police interviewed Marissa again and informed her that the blood evidence at the scene did not match her story. Marissa decided to come up with a new story that better matched the physical evidence. Here's what she told the police. Dale committed an assault of a sexual nature while she was in bed. When the attack was over, she climbed out of bed, retrieved a hammer, and struck Dale multiple times. During this attack, Stanley entered the room and took the hammer from her. Marissa was arrested for attempted secondary murder. Later, on February 9, 2009, Dale died from a pulmonary embolism. Marissa received an upgrade in her charges to premeditated first-degree murder. Almost five years later, on January 22, 2014, Marissa's trial started. On April 8, 2014, she was found guilty. About two months later, Marissa was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Was Marissa actually guilty of murder, or did she act in self-defense? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Marissa was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Marissa killed her husband with a hammer. She only admitted that she was responsible after hearing from the police that her original story was not plausible. Marissa was having an affair with Alan, the sugar daddy, at the time of the murder. She owed him hundreds of thousands of dollars. Marissa had initially promised to repay Alan by using an $8 million trust fund she was supposedly about to inherit from her stepfather's death. In reality, there was no trust fund, and her stepfather was still alive. Alan said that Marissa tried to hire a hitman to kill Dale. He gave her $7,000 for this purpose. The day before the murder, Marissa told Alan that she killed Dale with a tire iron after Dale attacked her. This, of course, did not happen. Prior to Dale's death, Marissa had taken out a $750,000 life insurance policy on him. The policy became effective at the beginning of January 2009, just two weeks before Dale was killed. In total, Dale had $1.25 million of life insurance. Marissa approached a bouncer at a dance club in Phoenix, who she had once dated. She tried to hire him to kill Dale, but he refused to participate. The bouncer thought the request was odd because Marissa had told him previously that Dale was dead. A bizarre incident occurred on February 10, the day after Dale died which supports the idea that Marissa was desperate for money. At 3 a.m., Marissa was found by a road with her jaw and ankle broken. She claimed that an unknown assailant attacked her. The police believed that Marissa had taken painkillers and had Stanley attack her with a sledgehammer. This is something that Marissa wanted him to do. Marissa originally wanted Stanley to shoot her in the spine and paralyze her, but Stanley thought that was too dangerous. She supposedly orchestrated this attack 
to collect half a million dollars of insurance. Rissa claimed that Dale had a long history of committing offenses against her, yet there wasn't hardly any evidence to support this. Marissa also claimed that her mother and stepfather mistreated her when she was a child, yet she gave custody of her children to them after being incarcerated. Prior to Stanley living with Marissa and Dale, the couple had a woman living there. She described Marissa as manipulative, a bad mother, a bad wife, and controlling. A mental health professional diagnosed Marissa with antisocial personality disorder, which is characterized by a number of symptoms, including being deceptive. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Allen was not a credible witness. He had been offered limited immunity in exchange for testifying against Marissa after inappropriate images were found on his computer, the types of images that could have sent him to prison for over 20 years. A mental health professional testified that Marissa's behavior was consistent with having been mistreated as a child. One of Marissa's daughters testified that she saw Dale mistreat her mother. That's pretty much it for exculpatory evidence. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Marissa was guilty? Yes, I believe she was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. She had a long history of manipulating men and confessed to repeatedly striking her husband with a hammer. Moving to the last section, the case of Marissa Duvall has been compared to the case of Jody Arias, a notorious young woman who murdered a love interest named Travis Alexander. Are these two cases really comparable? There are quite a few similarities. For example, Marissa was born in 1977 and Jody was born in 1980, so they were close in age. Dale was three years older than Marissa and Travis was three years older than Jody. The murders took place only about seven miles apart. Dale was murdered about six months after Travis. Both murders took place in a residence. The crime scenes had a lot of blood spatter and the victims were not wearing clothing when they were killed. A melee attack was featured in both crimes, although Jody also used a firearm. The trials for the crimes took place in the same courtroom. Marissa and Jody met each other while in jail. Both perpetrators said they had been mistreated as children and by the murder victims. They characterized the men that they murdered as aggressive and terrible. Marissa and Jody claimed that they killed in self-defense. Marissa was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and Jody was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. These disorders are both in cluster B, the dramatic erratic cluster, and have some overlap, including impulsivity. Both Marissa and Jody had low-level jobs and appeared to be aimless as far as their careers. The women maintained an intense interest in men for much of their lives and had several short-term romantic relationships. Despite all these similarities between Marissa Duvall, and Jody Arias, I think the motives in these cases were fundamentally different. Both Marissa and Jody understood that they had a talent for manipulating men, but they had different objectives for using this ability. Jody could not possess Travis, but wanted him. Marissa was married to Dale, but she wanted money instead. Both women wanted something that their personality characteristics prevented them from having. Jody wanted a stable romantic relationship but routinely introduced chaos. Marissa wanted a stable financial situation, but did not know how to manage money. Travis was murdered because his killer was angry. Dale was murdered because he was worth more to his killer dead. One lesson that can be learned from both of these cases is how a tendency to manipulate should never be dismissed as insignificant. The victims in both cases had clear warning signs that their lovers were dangerous, yet they were each murdered completely by surprise. Feelings of love distort reality on both sides of homicides related to romance. Those are my thoughts on the case of Marissa Duvall. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.